My name is Andrew Bridges. I'm a partner at Fenwick and West in San Francisco and Mountain View. I'm just going briefly to introduce the other panelists by name and affiliation. There's more biographical information in the material. Uh, first, we will hear from Rick Danis of Right Side Group. And then we'll hear from Phil Corwin of Virtual Law. Finally, Yala Willender, Yana Willender of Wikimedia Foundation I will go. And then we'll, uh, I may have some questions. We'll have questions from the audience. So without further ado, we'll start with Rick. Thank you, Andrew. Um, thanks for joining us. A huge crowd for domains. Everybody's excited about them, apparently. Um, as I said, the uh, World Cup's going on. But uh, um, appreciate you coming. Um, so I'll just jump into what I, what I thought I'd do is, um, actually, I want to start with, with a question. Uh, by show of hands, how many people in the room have registered a domain name? Okay, so most of us. How many uh, have registered a, dim a domain name that wasn't a, a com, org, net, edu, or biz? I have. <laughs> All right. Um, so I I'm going to start with a, a pretty general um, kind of broad overview of the domain name space. Uh, so apologies if this is oversimplified, but I want to make sure people know the sort of basics and the terminology before we jump into um, some of the more specifics about what's going on with the new, new TLD program. Um, so what the heck is a TLD? Top level domain is, it's the characters to the right of the dot in a domain name. So .com, .org, the, the things I just went through, that's a top level domain. Um, in 2011, we'll get, we'll get into this is what we're all here to talk about. The uh, Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, um, ICANN, uh, which is, I'll explain a bit more in a second what exactly their role is. They un unveiled a new program to expand the domain uh, extension world to essentially um, qualified applicants could apply to be a registry operator for dot anything. Uh, again, presuming they were qualified once they went through the process. Um, so, again, just a very general high-level overview. ICANN is a not-for-profit corporation that manages the domain name registration system um, and, and the system for routing internet uh, users to the correct domain name or the correct website. Um, <clears throat> a registry, that, so I've, I've been in the domain industry for only about five years. I didn't, uh, I didn't know any of these terms. I didn't know anything about the domain space before I got into it. And so I would interchange registry and registrar, and I didn't know what they were. So this is, again, high level. But a registry, um, it maintains the system of record for the registration of the domain name associated with a given TLD. So .com or .org, you know, VeriSign is the registry operator for .com. So every single .com name that's sold out there, VeriSign maintains the, the database, essentially, for, for all those .com names. Um, they set the wholesale price for those domain names. And then they're sold through a registrar. Um, the biggest one and, and one most of you have probably heard of is GoDaddy. Uh, my company owns a couple others, uh, enom and name.com. The registrar is, is the uh, entity that then sells the domain name to an end user or a registrant. Um, and the registrar sets the uh, wholesale price to if they have a reseller model. So for example, you could buy domain names from Google. Uh, and they might actually be acquiring them through our enom service. So they would set the wholesale price to Google, or they'll, in the <clears throat> retail case like a GoDaddy or a name.com, they'll set that price to the end user customer. So as I mentioned, ICANN opened up uh, the application process a couple years ago, or geez, three years ago now. Um, and just to give you some statistics to give you an idea of what's, what's going on, and this is here and happening right now, um, there were approximately 1,300 different TLD strings that were applied for um, by 1,900 different application, applicants. So, so a, a lot of those were applying for the same string. Um, the interesting thing, too, is that a lot of those were, uh, there were some really big players like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, but there were also big brands that applied. So .Nike will be an extension, um, .BMW, .Ferrari, and many, many, many others. It's about split about half and half between brands and uh, what we call generic top-level domains. Uh, over $350 million were spent on just the applications alone. 
Um, currently, right now, these, these numbers are actually a few days old, uh, there are over 200 new, new GTLDs currently available right now. Um, one of the problems I think we're facing in our industry is that not a lot of people know that. Uh, so that's one of the challenges for us. Uh, but even given that, uh, there are over, this, as I say, this number, the 950 is, is a bit old, there are a, about 1.1 million registrations uh, to date in, in new, just new GTLDs. Um, and then just, uh, just so you understand sort of the, the, the stages and, and where, if you're advising clients, where you might want to uh, be advising them. Um, the, the first phase of a launch of a GTLD is called the sunrise phase. Uh, and this is the phase where trademark holders have sort of first, first uh, opportunity to go in and register extensions in a TLD. Um, it's only rights, rights holders who've registered with uh, the Trademark Clearinghouse, which is a service uh, where uh, trademark holders can apply and um, show evidence of their trademark. And then uh, they have the right to then apply in the sunrise period. Um, they also have, uh, there's a service that's provided where if someone attempts to register a second level domain in a, in a new top level domain um, that, is their, that matches their trademark, they get a claims notice and they, they're made aware of the fact that someone's trying to register uh, Microsoft.ninja. Um, that's a real string. Um, so they have the opportunity then to, to be made aware. Uh, and the, if I'm trying to register Microsoft.ninja and I'm not the, the rights holder, I get a claim notice as well. Uh, so we can talk, we'll talk a bit later about the success of that and what that's been doing. Uh, next, the next phase would be Land Rush, um, which is just an early application period where you sort of a premium name. You can, you can pay more to, to, uh, uh, to get in first before other applicants. And then after that uh, comes general availability where it's just open to anyone to register domain names. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through this and we can talk about this later, the registrar and registry liability. I just wanted to give that kind of that brief uh, that brief update. And actually, I, I think I think most of this we can talk through later as we get questions about. Okay. You want to switch it over? Just a quick yeah. Hi there. Uh, I'm Phil Corwin, and uh, let me uh, so this one. Yeah. Yeah, it works. Uh, I've been involved with ICANN activities uh, since 2006. Uh, I'm counsel of the Internet Commerce Association, which is a trade group of uh, domain name investors and developers, not cyber squatters, but people who develop domains, mostly generic name domains, and uh, monetize them in various ways. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, ICANN's business constituency. Uh, I'm involved in... Uh, the ongoing process, uh, I don't know if you heard, but the uh, U.S. announced in March that it's going to uh, end its remaining relationship with ICANN, the so-called IANA functions, and transition that to the global multi-stakeholders, uh, whoever that is. <laughs> and uh, the big debate there is what type of accountability will ICANN remain under uh, because once the U.S. Uh, uh, ends that relationship because the renewal of the IANA contract has been a... Uh, kind of a leash on ICANN to uh, keep them from going too far astray. Uh, I'm also a member of the Internet Committee and of the Internet Governance Subcommittee of the International Trademark Association, and uh, I've been a consultant to new TLD applicants and others. And uh, I'm going to overlap a bit with uh, Rick's presentation, but kind of from a different angle. Uh, so protecting your brand. Uh, there are two new rights protection mechanisms, the Trademark Clearinghouse, and uniform rapid suspension. What's the trademark clearinghouse? Basically, if you have any uh, trademark anywhere in the world uh, that meets certain requirements, it's been around for a minimum period, it's actually been in use, et cetera, you can register that in the clearinghouse, which is a, a database of global trademarks for $150 per year per registered uh, trademark. What that gives you is an ability to register your mark during the sunrise period that Rick referred to. Uh, and that last sunrise period lasts for at least 30 days at each new TLD as it goes live. It also generates if somebody tries to register an exact match of whatever you've registered in the uh, clearinghouse, 
it generates a warning to them called a trademark claims notice saying, you know, you may be committing trademark infringement if you go ahead with this registration. Uh, and, uh, you know, if it's like Microsoft uh, Ninja, it's, pr it's pretty clearly going to be infringement. If it's uh, United.Ninja, it all depends on what's at the website, if the website is developed, because that's a generic word used by lots of different companies for different lines of commerce. Uh, so that notice is generated during the first 90 days of each that each uh, new TLD is open. And then after that first 90 days, and as long as you're registered in the clearinghouse, if someone registers something that would have generated a claims notice, you as the trademark owner get a notice that that's happened, and then you can look into it and uh, see if you think you need to uh, bring a UDRP or a URS, and I'll get to that in a minute, or uh, file a Lanham Act uh, action or whatever. Uh, trademark clearinghouse uses, and this was as of May 12, 2014. These were figures given at the INTA annual meeting in Hong Kong. It's up a little bit now. As of then, there were about 29,800 trademarks registered. It's about 30, 31,000 now, of which uh, nearly 98% have been verified and have gotten into the database. That represented trademark uh, uh, registrants in the clearinghouse from 11,000 separate organizations based in 97 separate countries uh, with 117 legal jurisdictions. So it truly is a global database for new TLD purposes. The uh, 46,000 and change registration notifications have been sent to the trademark owners uh, of possible infringement of their uh, uh, trademarks, and that was generated by more than 700,000 new TLD registrations at the time. As Rick mentioned, now we're over a million. Uh, Actually, uh, the 29,000 and now 30,000 registered, that's pretty low usage when you consider the millions of trademarks around the world, and that probably reflects decisions based on just the scale of the program, over 1,000 new TLDs, that the main benefit you get here is you get to the front of the line on defensive registrations, but no one's going to do defensive registrations in hundreds and hundreds of new TLDs. If we were talking about 100 new ones, I think there'd be a lot more defensive registrations, but at the scale, it just doesn't, defensive registrations just don't scale, uh, and, you, and most big companies uh, already employ monitoring services to warn them of potential infringement. Uh, anyway, let me give you two ideas of what's going on of, of uh, things, one, where one registry operator is trying to generate registrations to protect trademarks, and another, something else that's gone. Uh, this is an ad that was placed at IP Pro the Internet by uh, Famous Form Media, which is another registry operator, about the, their new dot .webcam uh, website. And you might think, well, what about dot .webcam? And I'm going to read from the, uh, this is their ad about their top-level domain. Early data points indicate that dot .webcam domain names will have a strong uptake by the adult entertainment industry. It's with the above in the mind that Famous for Media, the registry operator, highly recommends that brand owners protect their core brands in new dot .webcam TLD. I mean, the, the, between the lines, it's basically, if you don't do a Sunrise registration, somebody might register your trademark and use it for adult entertainment purpose. And in, and in fact, on uh, June 9th, Famous Four sold four dot .webcam adult uh, names including tube.webcam, asian.webcam, and milf.webcam uh, for a total of $175,000. So uh, they're, they're clearly uh, marketing to the adult industry, but also trying to get uh, trademark owners to do defensive registrations there. Something else that's happened in the last week is that uh, one of the old line registrars, uh, which again is our middlemen that, bro that sell domain names, Network Solutions, uh, there's a new uh, TLD called .xyz. Uh, Network Solutions, uh, for all their existing customers, sent them an email saying, if you've already got something .com or .org or whatever, we're going to give you a free match to that domain name and .xyz unless you hit this link now and opt out of your domain. So it's kind of an involuntary domain registration on behalf of their clients. And I, I wrote an article that it's one of the uh, 
the websites that was involuntary registered through that opt-out was DisneyTime.xyz. Now, DisneyTime.com or .org or whatever might or might not be infringing. To be infringing, it's got to be in use, and it might be in use for a fair use purpose, like you know, parody or criticism or whatever. But uh, Network Solutions put its own landing page there with the links to uh, hit records. You know, it was all about music, which is a business Disney in it. So that raises some legal issues we're going to get into now, might get into during the discussion. But this gives you an idea of some of the things going on. Uniform Rapid Suspension was created as a narrow, low-cost, faster supplement to the UDRP uh, arbitration policy, which most of you are probably familiar with. It's an alternative to going to court. Uh, the cost is the filing fee is 500 versus about 1500 at uh, for a WIPO or National Arbitration Forum uh, UDRP filing. There is a higher standard of proof, uh, which is uh, proving bad faith registration and use by clear and compelling evidence, not just preponderance of the evidence. And what you get if you win a URS is you don't get the domain transferred, the domain is suspended for the rest of the registration period. Trademark owners are unhappy that they don't shut it down forever, and, I, and we can talk about some changes that might made, be made uh, when ICANN reconsiders all of this before the second TLD round uh, to, to uh, take care of that. Uh, URS usage, again, as of mid-May, uh, there have been 46 cases filed with the National Arbitration Forum and three with the Asian Domain Name Dispute Resolution Center, which is based in Hong Kong. Those, those are the only two accredited URS providers Right now, uh, complainants prevailed 78% of the time, denied in 22%. And uh, those cases don't represent the full range of potential infringement based on registration so far at new TLDs. But a lot of the domains were just registered. They're dark right now. So you can't allege bad faith use because there's no use at the moment. They don't resolve. Uh, so. Uh, how do you protect your brand in, in this brave new world of more than a thousand new top level domains, whereas we've had 21 up to now, plus the uh, country code TLDs? Uh, again, defensive registrations are probably not feasible, not on any broad scale basis. Uh, there are existing service based brand protection strategies. They tend to be expensive. They, they, again, they don't scale well. Uh, Full disclosure, the company I'm going to mention is a client of mine, but it, I think they're an example of new approaches. It's an Israeli company, Brand Shield. Uh, they have new infringement detection software that scours both websites and social media and can be manipulated by the user to give different priorities, to uh, filter in different ways, uh, and gives you a lot of content analysis far beyond just the domain name, but what's actually going on at the TLD. And I think we're going to see more and more of these approaches because how do you search out a thousand new TLDs plus all the infringement going on on social media? Can I just, yeah, I just mentioned. So we we're a, I didn't mention this up front, which I should have done. Is that we my company is a, is a uh, an applicant for um, a large chunk of domain names as well, and we have a product that we're offering that that is called uh, do, the Domain Protected Marks List, and you can for a, a relatively much smaller fee. You can block a trademark term across all of the TLDs that we run as a registry. Right. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, what you were. Yeah, thanks to. for mentioning that. I was going to, you have it, Donuts, which is the number one uh, TLD applicant, uh, has it. Uh, but that's for each individual portfolio registry operator. It doesn't protect you at all, new TLDs, just for the ones Correct. they're operating. But it is a lot less than defensive registrations at all of the TLDs they operate. Uh, Anyway, you can read the rest about Brand Shield, the, the approach. It's on uh, this side. It even has a cease and desist notification management module. And, and one of the legal issues that was discussed at the intermeeting in Hong Kong, you know, to protect your trademark, you have to protect it. If you don't respond to infringement, uh, it, it could be charged that you weren't actively protecting it and you've lost the trademark. Uh, uh, for infringement protection purposes. So one of the things that was discussed there is how far do you have to go? If, if you find infringement at 10,000 websites, do you have to send a cease and desist to everyone? And some of the attorneys there thought that courts might say, well, if you've got a good reason why, if the infringement's so low and there's so little traffic, 
You might just do a memo to file saying, we looked at this, we know there's some very minor infringement going on, but it just isn't worth going after. They're getting two hits a week. Uh, will the courts recognize that? Who knows? I think we're going to have to see how the courts uh, deal with this uh, uh, new world. Now, uh, if, you've got, if your company name is a generic word, like United, or if one of your top brands is a generic word, uh, there's going to be a second round of new top level domains. Uh, uh, I had lunch at the last ICANN meeting in Singapore uh, with one of the board members who told me that the thinking on the board is that the second round will not, it'll just, they'll start a new round and it'll be indefinite. It'll just be whenever you want to apply for a new TLD. There will, there'll be a start date but not an end date. Uh, we found out in the first round that if you have these generic words that are your company name or a brand name, the uh, legal rights objection against infringement at the top level won't work. There were two cases that I'll cite. Uh, there are two new TLDs, dot .limited and dot .express. Those words, a lot of us associate that with two clothing companies. They brought a legal rights objection and they lost because the, the way it's framed, those are generic words and uh, you know, just because you use it for clothing doesn't mean that people can't register domains there for lots of other things. So if you're in that situation, you really have to consider whether you're going to put in a dot brand application in the second round to make sure that nobody else gets that, uh, if that's a concern for you. Uh, i got one more minute. So uh, domain valuation. Up to now, the most valuable domains have been at .com, with dom that second in the generic TLDs, and in certain country code TLDs like .uk, .de, et cetera. Uh, we don't know yet which top-level domains, if any, will have that kind of value. It's going to take uh, time to see how the market sorts this program out. So far as the left of the dots, short, meaningful domain names are still going to have the higher value, the highest value for aggregating. Uh, traffic and uh, a lot of the new TLDs uh, provide specific verticals which if they match with uh, your product or service it might be worth uh, registering uh, domains there uh, because it's going to make sense you might you're going to you can build your brand around that specific purpose and finally uh, wrapping up doo -doo. yeah uh, the big issues up at ICANN the next two years are reviewing the first TLD round and making any changes in the program for the second, uh, review of all the rights protection mechanisms, and uh, separately UDRP uh, review. Uh, there's potential congressional review, I think, in the next Congress of the uh, Anti-Cyber Squatting Act, which is almost two decades ago old and really didn't envision this kind of world we're in now. Uh, and uh, there's also this uh, question of uh, when and how is uh, ICANN going to sever its final ties to the U.S. and what new accountability measures will be put in place uh, to replace the U.S. role. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope that was useful. Yeah? Quick question. You mentioned the bad faith test for, for domain registry. If someone registers for a domain in good faith but doesn't use it commercially, would a <coughs> free competitor or wants to use that domain have any uh, nullity action or any remedy the rest of the world? No, not I don't believe so. Under the UDRP, which is you know the arbitration, I don't think there's a Lanham Act claim there. And, and UDRP, to get the domain transferred, you must show bad faith registration and use. And if uh, if there's no use, or if the use of the domain uh, is not infringing, the fact that you would like it, uh, and, and there have been UDRP guys where people say, well, it'd be a lot more valuable to our company than the person who has it, and the arbitrators basically say that's tough unless you can show, meet both both parts of the test, you don't get a transfer. I, I think under the anti cyber squatting Consumer Protection Act, either registration or use is a ground. But in the UDRP, it has to be registration and use. Yeah. Uh, but let's hold further questions if we may till the end. Let's hear from Yana, and then we'll, we'll I'll have a bunch of questions in the audience I can ask as well. So I'm Jana Wollinger, I'm Legal Counsel at the Wikimedia Foundation, where I lead um, the trademark work, among other things. So I'm going to talk about this a little bit more from an in-house lawyer's perspective. So um, just by way of background, we pre previously had 22 top-level domains um, up until 2011. We're going to have uh, 1,400 new top-level, up to 
1,400 top top level domains issued. Um, and for most in-house, well, and the point is that it's supposed to enhance competition and communication. But for most in-house lawyers, uh, we work for companies that already have registered um, their domains and established them and so forth. So most of what we can be working on is trying to figure out how we can prevent cyber squatters from um, essentially registering our trademarks as domains or um, misspellings of our trademarks for these uh, 1,400 new top-level domains. And that's going to be very costly, particularly if you have a lot of different sites um, um, like us. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Wikimedia, we have 14 sites, uh, which includes Wikipedia, which is usually the one that people have heard about. Um, and um, so I'm just going to talk about some strategies for, for this. Um, so ICANN and um, the registries have set up um, several mechanisms for dealing with um, cyber squatters. And the main one is the trademark clearinghouse. I think we've all talked about the trademark clearinghouse now, so I can sort of just um, jump into some of the problems with the trademark clearinghouse method. Um, and, and the main problem is that it only applies, it only allows you to register domains that um, exactly match the trademarks that you were able to clear with the trademark clearinghouse. And uh, first of all, the, the, the biggest problem, obviously, for, for companies is going to be the fact that you're registering domains defensively that you're not going to be using. Um, and so obviously, we'll often feel like this is just you know, waste of uh, um, time and, and resources, um, and um, it's not something we want to be doing. Uh, but also, it's a it's a costly process. It takes several months, um, and the clearing only lasts for um, a year. So you have to continue renewing them, and um, it only apply um, it only helps you with uh, domains that exactly match your trademarks. So it doesn't help you with um, typo squatting typo squatting cases or. Uh, with uh, trademarks that have um, common law trademarks or pe uh, trademarks that are currently pending. For typo squatting cases in particular, that's a difficult, really difficult problem for registries because how do you know when a misspelled trademark is so close to your trademark as to be, as to be confusingly similar? Um, and similarly, um, there's going to be situations where it is quite uh, similar to your mark, but it is intentionally similar to your mark, and it's um, it's used to criticize uh, the company, kind of like you know um, someone uh, using uh, registering um, whole fools instead of whole foods, right? Um, so so that's going to be so we really can't expect registries to be able to automatically block off all of the misspelled names for for our trademarks. Um, and, there, and then there's a number of registry-specific solutions. So we've talked about the, the um, domain-protected uh, marks list. Um, basically, it's a great uh, uh, way of blocking off um, all of the domains across um, all of the, um, your trademarks for each and every one of the top-level domains across one registry. So it's, uh, it, it, it becomes much cheaper than defensively registering them. But it's based on the trademark clearinghouse method. So all of the problems that we face with the trademark clearinghouse method essentially applies there, too. We can't block typo squatting uh, uh, domains, and we can't um, uh, prevent uh, uh, infringement of unregistered trademarks. Um, and then another, oh sorry, another um, alternative method that is registry specific is something that Google is doing, which is to extend the um, the um, sunrise period for an additional 60 days, and also uh, providing an indefinite period when they will be providing notice for up to 50 um, abused, previously abused marks. So that's you know somewhat helpful. Um, and then there's going to be some um, top-level domain-specific solutions um, for trademark holders. One is that several of the, oh, actually half of the uh, top level domains appear to be brand uh, top level domains that companies are registering for themselves. And for most part, they're not necessarily going to be releasing them uh, to the public to register domains. So, so when Google registers .google and .youtube, they're not going to be releasing those to the public, and we don't have to worry about registering wikipedia.google because cyber squatters won't be able to, to, to do it either. Um, and similarly, there's going to be um, some geographically specific top-level domains like .nyc, which will be limited to specific uses um, that are uh, related to the geographic area. Um, likewise, there's going to be some uh, professional uh, top-level domains like .esquire and .law, and they're, they're also less likely to be cyber squatted. Um, so, in addition to the 
um, um, cyber spotting issues, uh, there's going to be some additional challenges with the new top level um, domains. Um, and one is name collision, which is essentially that whenever you have a domain based on the new top level domains that exactly matches a domain um, that previously existed on an internal network, basically because a sysadmin was able to set up configure that network to have whatever top level domain they wanted to have instead of having that approved by ICANN. And so um, and the problem with that would essentially be that if, you, if people were previously used to using the internal network, they could now be confused because there's essentially going to be two sites with the same, uh, with the same address and you could be, users could be exposed to phishing um, attacks or uh, emails could be redirected to, to the wrong place. So ICANN's solution is essentially to subject um, top-level domain applicants to a, a collision assessment process if they think that the top-level domain is likely to um, have lots of these collisions. And um, in some um, top-level domain applicants were able to proceed without an assessment if they locked off a number of second-level domains that were um, more likely to have collisions. We've kind of come across um, this quite a bit when we tried to register domains with the word wiki because it turned out that there were a lot of um, internal networks that used wikis and would include the word wiki in their um, domain name. So there were a lot of collisions there. The other, um, um, the other new issue is, um, is the sort of the top and second level split when you have domains like wiki.media because uh, when we clear a trademark with the trademark clearing house, we'll essentially only be able to clear um, our entire trademark, and so we won't be able to register things like this in the sunrise period. Um, similarly, you won't be able to block off um, domains like this in, in, with, with the different blocks that are available through the registries. So that's, um, that's another problem that um, essentially it will, it will be up to um, trademark holders to buy the domains in the land rush period, which could be up to um, 11 grand per domain during the first day, so that's going to be quite expensive, um, or to proceed to UDRP or URS action. Um, and I'm, I'm actually going to skip branding um, strategies just, just because I think we want to get to questions quicker. Um, so in terms of valuing domain names, um, in the past, obviously, there's been some clear priorities about which domains have been more valuable. So if you were a you know, serious company, you may want to get something like .com or .org if you're a nonprofit. Um, or you may want to get a um, top-level domain in that you, you, you can use to spell out your name over both the top and the second-level domain, like Bitly. Um, and um, of course, now it's much less obvious which domains are going to be the more, more valuable uh, for you to, to register. Similarly, for trademark holders, we kind of need to figure out um, what priority we want to um, register marks in defensively or block off marks, because obviously we're not in a position where we can register all the marks and misspellings of our marks for all of the top level domains, particularly the ones that um, um, we won't be able to do in the sunrise period and we'll have to get at the escalated price during the land rush period. Um, and so I think that sort of a good strategy to think about in, in light of this is to um, first block off as many domains as we possibly can because that's the cheapest way of, of doing it. And uh, if we do it early on, we can uh, block them off before they're, they're being sold because blocks won't, um, uh, won't work retroactively. Um, and then um, secondly, we want, may want to think about um, defensively registering domains that can't be blocked but are more likely to be infringed. So for us, it's going to be basically any domain that include, includes Wikipedia because that's our most famous brand. Um, and then um, you want to, may want to think about registering, defensively registering domains that are that sound reasonable based on what your business model is. So again, uh, we may want to think about registering domains like Wikipedia that education, just because th there's higher uh, probability of um, um, user confusion for, for domains like that. And then finally, you may want to think about registering domains that don't necessarily sound reasonable, but are um, likely to somehow damage your brand. So like, you know, you may want to register that porn or um, was the, the example that came up, that webcam, not something that would have, um, that I would have thought of um, initially. And then the, finally, um, it, we'll just have to sort of use um, software um, to search for 
infringing domains after the fact and, and try to send them uh, cease and desist letters and proceed with UDRP actions and URS actions. And essentially how aggressive you want to be with that is going to depend on your company and what kind of strategy you employ. Um, our strategy is to very carefully assess any kind of um, actions before we proceed because we have a um, free knowledge mission and so we're uh, always sort of broadly interpreting fair use and um, using any kind of IP rights as sparsely. So that's, I'm going to stop there. Great, so thank you. I have uh, several questions uh, that I'd like to ask and I'd like to open it up to the, to the audience. So I, uh, I attended the meeting in Geneva, I think it was April 30, May 1 of 1997 where the Internet Ad Hoc Committee proposed the expansion of the GTLD space to, I think, a whopping seven domains. And the, the articulated reason for that was Delta. There's Delta Airlines and Delta Fawcett and Delta Dental, and they couldn't all share Delta.com. And so the argument was that there was a need for domains for uh, companies where uh, there was competition at the second level, so they needed to be more uh, top-level domains. Um, the argument was that, there were, that, that more companies would have access to the key second-level domains. What happened in my experience was that uh, all the new registrars would go back to the holders of the existing .com and say, please buy these others before somebody else gets them and the scarcity continued and it was actually sort of an arms race to, per, to perpetuate the scarcity so that people could corner the market. That's sort of my editorializing. So my question is, is there a scarcity problem now that this seeks to cure or is this just the creation of lots of inventory for sales and monetization uh, and profits? Um, what, what's, uh, is, is there a problem that's getting solved okay. by this? Oh, that was going to be easy. Well, I'll, <laughs> there, yeah. whether, I, I can't tell you whether or not there was scarcity. I think some of these new TLDs will be successful. Some, I think, are going to sink beneath the waves, and, and uh, the registry operators are not going to make much profit, if any, on them. Uh, this was long debated with ICANN. The, I could tell you the business and... IP sectors within ICANN, and ICANN is truly a multi-stakeholder organization. There's not two sides to every story, there's like a dozen sides to every story. Within ICANN, it was debated for years. Uh, there was strong pressure uh, from uh, particularly registries and registrars to open things up. And the decision, it was a three-year debate that preceded the three-year debate on the rules in the applicant guidebook. Uh, and what was going on, I think, was a critical factor. At the time, there was a big dispute from an earlier round over dot triple X, which is supposed to be, was supposed to be a dedicated TLD for adult content. And it turned into a big legal dispute for ICANN. So, so ICANN, I think their legal department said, we don't want to be, we agree the goal is to have more TLDs. If we set a limit on the number of applications or how many we'll introduce, uh, we're going to have to make subjective judgments about which ones can go ahead and which ones can't, and that's going to create more legal problems. So if we're going to have more TLDs, the easiest thing for us, I can, from a legal liability viewpoint, is just to say, let's see if these people want to ante up $185,000 application fee and the real cost of applying when you add in consultants, legal, et cetera, about half a million minimum for TLD. Let's just see what the market decides, and that's how it became an unlimited application program. Right. I, I, yeah, I would say that there, there's a study, and I wish I had it at, at hand, that, that does suggest that there is scarcity in especially .com, in that there are, I don't know, what's the number, 270 million registrations in .com, and... No, it's about 110. 100, sorry, 270, 270 total, total, the total yeah. world, yeah, um, of, of, of existing TLDs. Um, at any rate, it's a large number, and that, and, and anecdotally, I mean, if you think about it, if you're searching for a domain name on it with a .com extension, uh, but I think the study was it takes eight or, eight or nine tries before you get one, and it's certainly not your first choice, and clearly not your second, third, fourth, fifth, et cetera. So 
Um, that's why you end up with these companies now with very strange and you know, hyphenated you know, websites. But, but part of that yeah. scarcity comes from the fact that there are many companies that own a gazillion domain names which are simply parked. Correct? Yeah, that's, that's a, yes, that's a fact, yes. There are many parked yeah. domains. So did anybody other than registries and registrars and adult entertainment companies push for expansion of the GTLD space? Actually, the adult sector didn't. In fact, they tried they to stop. It, yeah. okay. They tried so, to stop tri right. that so triple did, did anybody other than registries and registrars push for this? No. I, I don't. Yeah. That was don't mainly the, the suppliers and the middlemen who okay. pushed it forward. Okay. Um, but couple, that, that's an old debate. That was debated from 2005 to 2008, right. and now we're dealing with this new reality. And I understand. Um, <clears throat> There are some who believe that the U.S. government took the position that it just did about uh, ICANN and the IANA contract saying we're looking to uh, detach ICANN from U.S. government supervision, that the U.S. government did this cynically because it said it would do so only if another system were to come forward that would be acceptable and perhaps this was cynical because the view is no other acceptable system would come forward. In the meantime, this statement would get uh, pressure taken off the U.S. government at the next ITU uh, meeting uh, where there's, there's, there's been great controversy at the last meeting over U.S. government control of the Internet. What's your read on what the U.S. government is really up to in this decision? I'm up to my eyeballs on this subject in Washington. Well, I'm not gonna, whether or not it was done cynically with the expectation that no plan could ever come up that would be acceptable, I'm not going to speak to that. There's theories on both sides. I, the timing was because, this is all because of Snowden. Snowden's the main reason. Uh, it created a big, a lot of country, Russia, China, Iran, and others for years have been saying it's not fair that the U.S. has a special relationship, special control over the Internet that we don't have. It should be uh, parceled out to everybody. A lot of them were pushing for U.N. control. Snowden made the U.S. position vis-a-vis -vis ICANN very difficult. The ICANN board and CEO used the Snowden to, uh, uh, affair to uh, engineer something called the Montevideo Statement, which was issued in Montevideo, Uruguay, last October, which was ICANN and the other, uh, called the I-Groups, the 12 Inter Internet Engineering Task Force, Internet Society, et cetera, put out a statement said the time has come to globalize the ANA functions and ICANN, which everybody read as, you know, end the last vestige of U.S. control. And then the CEO went to Brasilia and got the president of Brazil to agree to host a meeting which came to be called Net Mundial that was held in April. And the U.S. announcement came a month before Net Mundial, and I believe it was made to defuse that conference uh, so that the U.S. can announce we're committed to globalizing and as soon as we figure out who the function goes to and what new accountability measures accompany it to defuse that meeting in Brazil so there wouldn't be a lot of anger and calls for doing it right now. How it's going to play out, uh, I could spin you a couple of different scenarios. Rick, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, I, don't, I don't want to overstate it and say this is much ado about nothing, but it's, it's been in the works, for, you know, it's been the plan all along that the IANA functions would be transferred out, um, and I don't feel if you would disagree with that, but that's, that's my understanding. And the, you know, the decision or the announcement that it would be transferred to a multi-stakeholder group, I mean, that's, that's ICANN, and that's, the, that's part of what ICANN does. So, I, um, you know yeah. the, the 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 constituencies and the stakeholder groups that are um, that participate in ICANN, while they are global, most of the uh, contracted parties are Western, and most of them are U.S. Yeah, that, that yeah. leads me so that, to, to relate it. Let me okay. Sorry, let me. I want to keep moving. Then I sure. get a couple of questions. That leads me to a related issue. Um, the United States government has seized at least 2,500 domains by asserting jurisdiction at either the registry or the registrar level. I think the London police have actually uh, managed to seize control of some domains, whether that was through legal process or through uh, sort of voluntary cooperation by some registrars. Uh, 
are these actions by the U.S. and uh, U.K. government entities uh, causing more thought to be given to locating uh, new registries for these yeah. GTLDs in uh, jurisdictions where these governments will have less power? Yeah, a lot of the new registry operators are, are located in places like the Caymans and Gibraltar and other places, and if you get a domain at one of those and you use a non-U.S. registrar, then it wouldn't be particularly easy for the U.S. government uh, to, to do a domain seizure the way they do on .com or .net, which are run by VeriSign in the Eastern District of Virginia. Just to finish up on the last point, the, the debate on the, the role of the U.S., the remaining role of the U.S. is merely ministerial. ICANN says we're going to delegate uh, dot photography. Uh, the Commerce Department, NTIA, says, looks it over, says, okay, and then they pass it on to VeriSign, which has a separate contract, to actually do the, the technical function of putting that new TLD into the master, the authoritative root zone file. So that... The debate's not so much over that function. It's about the fact that ICANN had to keep renewing that IANA contract with the U.S., put teeth into this affirmation of commitments that put some constraints on ICANN, and everybody expects that once the IANA functions go away from the U.S., that ICANN will exercise its right to give 120 days' notice and walk away from the affirmation of commitments. So the real debate is not over the IANA functions, about what new accountability structure uh, is going to be there for ICANN once they terminate the relationship with the U.S. I'm going to have one question for Yana, then open it up to the floor uh, if there are questions. Yana, uh, Wikimedia Foundation is a nonprofit. Um, without revealing trade secrets about what your legal budget would be, what do you think it is reasonable, uh, or, or what do you think that uh, uh, nonprofits are going to have to do um, financially to protect their existing uh, brands uh, in the light of the expansion of the GTLD space? I, I think generally we, we will have to, obviously we can't buy them all, we can't buy all of the domains, right? We can't buy them all defensively and, uh, and we can't possibly, you know, just because we have a, a famous brand doesn't mean that we, we, we can buy everything that, that you know, other famous brands can, can, can buy. Um, so, so we'll just have to, you know, figure out other strategies in terms of, um, you know, balancing out which uh, domains that will likely to be more infringed than others and trying to prevent um, registrations of those domains and kind of just uh, trying to see if there's particular domains that, that could be... Um, you know, less likely to confuse users and not necessarily going after those domains. Just to add to that, I think it, it, what we're seeing right now is where, as, as Phil mentioned, the trademark clearinghouse does not, it's, it, in my opinion, is underutilized at this point. I do think there's value there. Um, and we're not seeing, uh, a, maybe it's, it's, well, it's certainly related, but we're not seeing a lot of Sunrise uh, applications at this point. So there doesn't appear to be a lot of defensive registrations. And what we're seeing um, at our own registries is that the registrations that are coming during sunrise appear intent driven. In other words, they're not registering, uh, you know, uh, across um, every single string we have. And they're not actually buying a DPML product, but they're going out and, and for example, uh, some professional sports leagues are, are registering uh, dot reviews and dot social domains for all of their teams. That to me is, we, we have, we haven't seen it yet, but it seems to be intent driven. They're going to use those sites. So, is there? And I think there's so so, so the problem is that um, I, I think a lot of trademark holders are basically basing their clearing in the clearinghouse on previous infringements. And so we've all seen that most of our or a lot of our infringement comes from um, just typo squatting domains because there you know you can only get one. Um, Wikipedia.com, but you can get lots of misspellings of Wikipedia, right? So, um, so which you can't block in in the uh, um, trademark clearinghouse. Um, so, so, so we just know that from a from the perspective of trying to prevent infringement, that mechanism is not going to be very very successful. Yeah. Questions from? Well, just, just to add, I, I think part of the what's going on, and I think both both the perspective of business and IP owners and from the perspective of registries, 
ICANN hasn't done a particularly great job of putting the world on notice that this yeah. program is going on. I was frankly amazed at the intermeeting in Hong Kong that trademark lawyers, you would think they would know about this, how many of them were just beginning to get on top of the fact, even though new TLDs started rolling out early this year, it's like they just woke up to the fact that a thousand new TLDs are coming and just starting to think about what to advise their company or their clients about to do about it. So uh, there's been a very slow uptake outside the ICANN bubble that this program exists. Questions from the audience? You've yeah, been, you've yeah, probably we, been yeah, in some of these. We're, start. we're very involved in that process. So, if there's uh, more than one applicant um, for a particular string, um, the one way uh, to resolve it, and, and there are sort of ICANN has encouraged uh, the parties to resolve it privately, um, and haven't really said how to do that, but just said you know try to resolve it privately. Uh, if you don't resolve it privately, it, there's a sort of backstop uh, ICANN auction. So, and they've set a schedule for that. So if you haven't resolved it by the time it comes to ICANN auction, you're forced to go through that process with ICANN. The difference right now is that what most of the applicants are, are opting for is a private auction system wherein um, the, the, the sort of the loser is really the seller. So you're actually getting paid. So if, if I'm in an auction and it gets bid up to a million dollars and that's where I'm out, uh, and, the, and the other party says, well, I'm willing to pay, you know, $1.1 million. I get paid a million dollars to, to withdraw my application, and then they, they're the sole remaining applicant for it. So in those situations where you have a contention, is it not trademark, is it not brand owners that are part of that, or how does that happen? Yeah, so if, so that's a good question. If it were a generic term that were applied for, like, Phil's example of United, if, if Dot United had been applied, I don't know if it was, I don't think it was, but no. uh, Dot United had been applied for by two applicants, then they would have to figure that out. And it would actually, I, I think, likely go to, to our, if they both legitimately had trademark rights in that, uh, in that string, then they would end up going to an auction to resolve it. Um, yeah, it, it's just to add, there's one very large uh, uh, top level domain holding company in, in UK, uh, which is a publicly traded company, had lost money the last few years and showed, just reported a profit, which they got from losing private auctions no, sure. for some of the TLDs they had uh, applied for. I think all the registry, some, a few of the applicants don't want to do these private auctions, but but generally the registry operators view that one, they can walk, the losers can walk away with some money rather than losing everything, you know, not getting anything. And two, I think they're all pretty much agreed that they don't want ICANN getting any more money out of this. Right. Yeah. Uh, in the ICANN program. auction, you're paying you're paying ICANN, and you're not getting anything <laughs> as the as the one who's you know losing the, the application. So. I've got more questions in case you don't have any more. Audience, <laughs> um, why is WIPO not participating in the uh, URS uh, system? And then I've got some questions about the pricing of it, but do okay. we know why WIPO is not Yeah, uh, well, the pricing, uh, ICANN had promised a price of between three and 500. It's coming at about 500, and, you know, so they kind of, they promised the trademark community that it would be considerably less expensive than a UDRP filing, so that the two groups that were credited had to meet that target price. Uh, I think WIPO did not apply for two reasons. One, I don't think... I don't know that they thought they could meet the target price, but more important, they had, uh, and I know this issue very well because I lobbied against their position on behalf of that trade group I read, they wanted a situation where if the, there was no response from the domain registrant in a URS proceeding, there'd be no, evalu no further evaluation, basically be a default judgment in favor of the complainant, and uh, a lot of people objected to that, and when, I can't, when WIPO did not get the position they advocate on that issue, I think they just said we don't want to participate if we actually have to uh, review a case that where there's no response from the uh, registrant. So uh, that's my perception. I don't know if you have a different. No, one. I think that's right. I would I would say they couldn't meet the the fir your first comment about them not being able to meet the price and. and uh, so, okay, so let me follow up on that because I'm actually a WIPO domain arbitrator, 
and admittedly I'm fairly high priced, particularly by global standards, but I cannot decide a default properly for anywhere close to what I get paid, okay? Um, so I do it as a public service. And um, it seems to me that there is a real danger when it's priced this low, that you are either getting people who are unable to get sufficient work to stay busy, that they're going to do, they're going to do what they're doing extremely cheaply and not put any money into it, or they're doing it not for the money, but for some other reason, uh, to make an impact or whatever. Uh, why not just let this be flip of the coin or something like that for somebody actually to study evidence of bad faith and, and the like, $500 for a written decision is, is just nothing. What, well, what's, what's going on here? Well, I think, when, I think that brings up another issue that, that folks I represent are very concerned about. There's going to be more UDRP providers and probably more U.S. providers. Uh, I, when I can't accredit to you, and, and WIPO is certainly the best of the lot when it comes to UDRP decisions in terms of the quality decision, consistency. There's no binding precedent on UDRP, but they're supposed to generally follow uh, cases that have gone before in similar fact patterns. Uh, particularly now with international do domain names, which are in non-Latin scripts like Cyrillic, Arabic, Japanese, Chinese, there's going to be more regional pro arbitration providers. I can just, and remember the complainant picks where to file the case, and the registrant has no ability to uh, approve that. I can last year just approve the Arab Center for Dispute Resolution uh, in Amman, Jordan. They're going to be opening for business this year. But they're not limited to deciding UDRP cases for uh, Arabic IDNs. They can decide any case. I, I pretty much expect in the next year or two we're going to see uh, somebody apply from India or some other place with very low-cost legal services offering a $500 UDRP. And, you know, the complainants, they might, and they can attract complainants based on price and, and you know, the, the, so I think this is going to a coming debate with an ICANN because ICANN, once they accredit the UDRP provider, there's no contract, there's no real oversight of the quality of decision. So that's, uh, I think, an issue coming up in the future within ICANN. And isn't, isn't competition not merely on price but also on percentage of, of victories for the complainant since the complainant chooses sure. which forum to go to? Yeah. That's sort of like saying, uh, uh, sort of a little bit like, uh, why people might pick Marshall, Texas in patent yeah, cases. Yeah, right. You have something more you well, want I was to gonna, say? Well, I was going to just uh, add to, you know, the, the IP constituency were, were the ones lobbying for cheap URS, and cheap and quick. And so it's, a, it's an interesting comment from you that, that you know, it's, it's sort of impossible to do it for that. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the first two URS cases that were decided were filed by IBM on IBM.Guru and IBM.Venture, and they won both of them, right? I mean, that was, URS is only supposed to be for basically black and white cases. You know it when you see it. The theory was if you have to spend more than one or two minutes thinking about it, it should be in a UDRP. Well, we'll uh, uh, actually, I think we're, I won't go there. I think we're out of time. Uh, any questions from the floor? I need to remind folks uh, that uh, the, Session and conference uh, evaluations are electronic. The links are available on the conference website. So please do give your evaluations so that everybody can have feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you.